So it was like my second or third home game and I hadn't even been in the game yet. And I had tried to get in the gym and they stopped me. And they were like, oh sorry, this is the player's entrance. I was like, I know. He looked at me confused. And then so I was looking at him confused. And then he was like, oh, I'm sorry, are you a trainer? And I just kind of was just like standing there. And then another security guard came over and like whispered, I think he plays on the team. And guard, it's number 17, Jeremy Lee! Hey, Jeremy. Hi. <laughs> Nobody thought he could play. He had to fight for everything that he got. It's not often you think you've seen something you couldn't possibly see in the NBA. Lynn puts it up. Wait a minute, who's this kid? Wait, where's he from? Wait, not drafted? Wait, how many teams waived him? When this guy is playing and Golden State doesn't know he's any good, Houston doesn't know he's any good, I got to imagine that something has to do with he doesn't look the part. Jeremy Lin came from nothing to greatness. He, this kid is giving hope to all those kids that think never could I have a chance. I always told myself my progression is going to be become a rotation player, become a starting point guard, and then win an NBA championship. And people are definitely going to laugh when they hear that. You know, they're not going to be laughing until it actually happens. And now he'll have to take a seat. And again, Mike Whitney's coming in. Jeremy Lin, and you're a pretty big ovation. I know God orchestrated this whole thing. There's just too much out of my control. And just the way it happened is just miraculous. This is actually true. After I think age maybe eight or nine, we got rid of TV and we would just get it during the playoffs. We would watch it in the house and then in the backyard there's a glass door and a hoop outside. So we would just watch through the window. And then anytime there's like a break or a timeout, it was we'd go out and we'd do the exact move that just happened and it was pretty much all just copying Michael Jordan and watching him win. And so we loved watching basketball that way, and uh, it was always a dream of mine, but I didn't actually think it would be a reality. How did you get this done? Downtown. Here, oh, I'm yeah, down show you. in the Can village? You take a look? look at this. Let me see this what you... The back of... Hey, that must be done. <laughs> what do you think? What if they're done? Yeah. <laughs> it's been fantastic. Thank you. Every kid has a dream. Some want to be a fireman, others an astronaut. Most of the time, dreams are just dreams. This dream starts in Palo Alto, California, a suburb of San Francisco, where a young man learns about faith, perseverance, and opportunity. In台湾是我们是重视academic,我们并不重视打球。那时候上完班之后每次就很累,觉得很累。所以我在想说,既然我看篮球看了这么多,特别是NBA,那就我就开始练习打篮球。我自己练习了五年,就是像怎么追捕
My dad was taking us to the YMCA. We're still like elementary school. It was like open gym Monday, Wednesday, Fridays from like 7.30 to 9.30. We would just come home from school and we would just all do our homework as fast as possible. And then when someone couldn't finish their assignment, then we would go and help them. So if I couldn't finish, Josh would come over and help me. If Joe couldn't finish, you know, we would go over and help Joe. That's everything we've always known is just, you know, having each other and being best friends with each other. I didn't want to play the piano, and I was horrible at the piano. And like every year, the recital would come around, and I'd be pretty much playing the same song. And they were just like, this is not working. I'm wasting my money. All he does is play basketball. So let's just let him play basketball. As we grew to love the game, uh, my mom became a huge supporter. I think she could just see that we loved basketball, that we were passionate about it. And she's passionate about us. So whatever we want to do, she always wanted to support us. She always drove. She was always a team parent for every NJB, AAU that Jeremy played for, that I played for. She was always there, she was always supporting us. You know, not every mom, Asian mom especially, <laughs> is gonna support their child's playing basketball. Hi. Strong well. Strong well. If he wants something, he will do anything to get that thing. So he will knock his head on the ground. He will just make himself foul. He will do anything to get what he wants. Growing up, my family always emphasized God first, school second, athletics third. In the beginning, they weren't sure how long I could play basketball. They were just going to ride it out and have fun with it as long as we could. I got invited to a, a Y League game in Palo Alto. And he's just this little kid. It just, you know, you wouldn't think it, but. He just scored the basketball so well. We the first tournament we played, and he just starts just raining three-pointers. They will say I, I'm so loud because I will keep talking to defense, you know, get a rebound. Yeah. Of course, mom's like, how many points did he score? I was like, I told you he was pretty good. I go, I know. I know he's pretty good. Oh, the AAU team, they never want Jeremy. Even though he's the best point guard at that time, only this particular AAU Metro Maharaj won him so bad. I love being the underdog just because it's just what I'm used to. You know, I would be good in this league, and then people would say, oh, but he can't play well in this league. Every time Jeremy play against somebody who people say it's good, he Jeremy play better, then they start thinking that person is not good. They don't give Jeremy credit. Yeah. There's a $14 extra large burrito that's like this. Oh my gosh, you should all eat it. Jerry, you can get the uh, big one? I don't know how I got so tall, dude. I ate a lot. I would hang from monkey bars. Um, I would lie off the edge of my bed, thinking that gravity would <laughs> pull me <laughs> and make me taller. When I was 5'3", um, as a freshman in high school, I remember, my mom remembers this too, I would get in the car every single day and I'd be like, why aren't you taller? Like, this is why I'm so short. She always said, Blame your dad, I'm not that short. 
She's 5'6", for an Asian woman, that's pretty tall. And my dad's also 5'6". I think my biggest influence on him as a player, the, the, the most constant dominant conversation that we had was him creating for others. In high school, he knew he could get by and do well on his talent. A lot of kids, and, and him especially, it was all about scoring. And my constant conversation, my constant challenge with him was, Jeremy, you're a creator. You could really be the man if you just embraced who you are as a player. During his junior year, Jeremy emerged as the Vikings star. With every game, his skills and confidence grew. But so did his ego. We were like 30 and one at one point. We were killing everybody. I was starting to get a big head, thinking I was sweet and everything. And then I get hurt. Jeremy had a tradition of shooting around the night before his high school games. But on the eve of the state semifinal game, the high school gym was closed, and Jeremy played in a pickup game at his local YMCA. That night, Jeremy fractured his ankle, and his faith would be tested. I just pretty much broke down. Um, I broke down crying. Up until then, like, I'd never gone through any serious tragedy. That was the worst thing that ever happened to me. With Jeremy on the bench, the Vikings' hopes for a state championship quickly faded. You know, from a high schooler's perspective, that's, like, everything. I told him to take a step back and to look at it from a bigger perspective. I remember my brother sent me this really long letter. He talks about how God gives and takes away, and so, God took uh, what I really cared about at that time to show me that I can't do what I want to do, I can't accomplish what I want to accomplish without Him, and that nothing in this world, in my life, will happen that's not according to His plan. When David faced Goliath, he didn't know the outcome but he was zealous for the living God. With Jeremy, I know he puts the order God first, family second, basketball third. And he'll tell you this now at least, uh, looking back, it's more of God is in all those things. And in high school, he was humbled. He learned that he couldn't do everything himself and he could only put his faith God. I told myself, I have one year left of guaranteed basketball. I said, I'm going to do everything I can, and I'm going to go out fighting, and, and I'm going to make sure that we get back here. He had unusual poise for a, a high school senior, unusual confidence. There's something about him that uh, I could see why he was a great leader on the court because you're just driven to him. You're, you're, you can feel his heartbeat. Every close game they had, Jeremy Lin was making a big play. And it was every different way, a three-pointer, a steal at the end of the game. But every one he was in the middle of. He was the guy doing it. Lin takes a jump shot right side, hits. Oh, a nice jump shot. Lin for three. Buries it. Nothing was going to stop Jeremy from getting his team back to the state championship. And soon enough, Palo Alto faced Goliath. Inside Arco Arena, it's modern day, and Palo Alto is the CIF Division II state championship just moments away from tip off. I think a lot of people just assumed that getting to the state championship game, Palo Alto would be satisfied with. Jeremy Lin would be satisfied with it. And it was just much more of a formality when they played modern day high school. 
Southern California schools dominate the rankings. They're the powers at the Palo Alto out in the suburbs, not so much. Everybody said Modern Day was the team. Modern Day is the big dog. Modern Day, number 11 in the country. The whole week leading up to the game, it was just like, how are we going to get a rebound? How are we going to be able to play? I remember walking around campus, and there were all these uh, reporters, and they'd be like, oh, you think you can win? Like, how are you going to beat them? And everyone was asking me. My friends were asking me. By the end, they were like, you think you could beat them? I was like, man, just come to the game and watch. Along with Mater Dei's decorated history and dominant reputation, this varsity team had eight players over six foot six. I was kind of relieved that we were playing Palo Alto. But the more I watched my tape, I just had a feeling, you know what? These guys are better than I thought. You know, you don't get to the state finals by not being good. There's Lynn. Needs something good, and he finally got it. We were not intimidated at all and, and really came out playing our game. There's Lynn. Oh, there's that quick first step that they talked about. Palo Alto on a 9-2 run, and that's over. That kid can stroke the triple. Everybody on paper would say the size, the athleticism, the quickness is with the Monarchs. But it's the heart that is with the Vikings, and their heart has been on display so far tonight. At the end of the game, he hit the big shots at the big moments. Here's Lynn. Without that seven-footer, you can go to the rack. When the game was on the line, you know, he took over. Four seconds on the shot clock, and Lynn is going to have to launch a 25-footer. No one gave them a prayer to be on the floor with the athletes and the thoroughbreds that the Monarchs have. It's the best feeling to go out on top. I mean, it's, it's, it is a dream come true. It's why we love high school basketball, because of faces like that. When I really looked at everything, everything a basketball player could do for himself individually and for a team, Jeremy Lin was the best player here. But yet, colleges weren't clamoring for him. He just didn't fit the mold. After my senior year, I was just dying to play in college, and I felt like I deserved it. I remember it was just a very long process, very frustrating because I was going from Pac-10 school to Pac-10 school. I couldn't even get some Division III schools to look at me. And I was dying to go to Stanford. Um, I would go there and play with them all the time. I would always ask their coach, you know, what can I do to play for you? And yeah, I've always said if I was black, I would have gotten D1 scholarship, but that's my personal opinion. Well, he's an Asian kid. He's an Asian kid, and he's not seven foot tall. And you don't see a lot of Asian point guards uh, making a Division I basketball. Such a, a simple kind of thought, but that was the thinking. I say. I say he's relatable. <laughs> he's one of the most down-to-earth guys I know. We're always joking around. We're always, you know, pranking on each other. Alan, did you see the blue accented stuff? I did see. Do you like that blue? Yeah, I really like that blue. Because when I walk in, I don't want it to be like black, white, black. I want people to be like, dang. Is oh, that... shoot, son. Different walls need different accents. These are parents. <laughs> ah, dang. Look at that. Look at this. Ten bucks. I think when people hang out with him, they, they just realize he's just, you know, he's human. Despite being named Player of the Year and winning a state championship, Jeremy's only offer to play basketball on the collegiate level was from a small university called Harvard. My first day of class, I was just super intimidated. 
I went and took my math placement test and, uh, and they're like, if you don't know how to do this, feel free to turn it in and leave. I looked at it and I was like, dude, I don't know what's going on here. So I turned it in and I was like, maybe the second person who turned it in, I was like, man, I just like failed my first test at Harvard. The next day we had the Chinese placement test and they gave us a test and they're like, if you can't read it, just turn it in. I couldn't read it, so I turned it in again, and that was back-to-back -back failed tests without even filling in an answer. I called my mom, I was like, man, this is gonna be pretty tough, so just get ready. <laughs> in a lot of ways, Jeremy Lin going to Harvard was a very logical thing. There were 23 Asian Americans at Harvard whose last name was Lin. And so for Jeremy Lin to show up at Harvard being this Asian American kid who had a perfect math SAT2 score was, you know, nothing rare. But the fact that he was amazing at this game, the question was then how did he fit in at Harvard? There is Tommy Amaker, 1987 graduate of Duke, of course, first year at Harvard, 11th year overall as a head coach, 180 career wins. With the hiring of former Michigan coach Tommy Amaker, Harvard was committed to a new era in their basketball program. Amaker was a star player at Duke University, then spent nine years as an assistant coach to the legendary Mike Krzyzewski. The basketball landscape at Harvard was about to be transformed, and Jeremy, was leading the charge. We knew we had something pretty interesting, especially with Jeremy, because of uh, how hard he worked, first of all, and how important basketball was to him. And then his talent. Uh, I think he was very much underrated. And I think he wanted to play in the style and the system you know, that we were going to implement, which is going to be high octane. And uh, he's a hard charging, aggressive, fearless player. A steal by Jeremy Lin. He's going to win for the easy jam. Looking up ahead, Lin splits defenders and lays it in. All right, now. My 15 years of coaching, my four years at Duke, I've never seen anybody work as diligent and as hard as Jeremy. He came in every day and put the work in. We watched film every day. We did work before and after practice. He busted his tail, and he did all the things that we asked him to do. Top of the circle, deep three, Jeremy Lin. It seems the bigger the game, the, the better he played. It's Big East basketball as the 13th ranked UConn Huskies host the Crimson of Harvard. Now keep an eye on Jeremy Lin today. This is the type of player that can single-handedly help Crimson pull off a miraculous upset. He was the best player on the floor. You know, that's saying a lot when you're speaking of, of a team as the caliber of, of a Connecticut. Wow, hey, what a move on the runner off the glass. I think that's when everybody was like, all right, he's more than just like a good college player. Like he just made a very good team look bad. Casey had it knocked away and a steal by Dyson. Takes Lynn to the basket and Lynn blocks him at the rim. What a block. Scoring 30 points there, being forced to deal with in every way. The back to Lynn, top of the key. Pump fake, drives in, throws it down with both hands. Oh, what a dunk by Jeremy Lynn. He kept us believing all the way through that we have a chance. This guy is leading this team in every category, not just one. I mean, it wasn't like he was just a scorer. He was the best defensive player. He was the best rebounder, the best passer. You know, he, he pretty much could do it all. It was just kind of like those moments where it was crunch time and winning time. You know, who's going to step up? Back the other way comes McGurdy into the front court. Drives down the late lane line, goes up with the right hand, lays it in. Three seconds left. Harvard back the other way, down by a point. Jeremy Lee bumps it mid-court, lays it in, he's going to go! When I was growing up, I was playing in the AAU tournaments. We were playing games, and a couple times people would be like, yo, take your ass back to China, or like, you're a Chinese import, or whatever. When I got to college, it just like got crazy. It was just like, you chink, you know, can you even open your eyes? Can you see the scoreboard? You know, just like crazy stuff. And I'd just be like, dude, like what is going on? Being in the spotlight brought Jeremy an inevitable byproduct, attention, both positive and negative. I mean, people look at, at basketball players 
in terms of of race. A lot of times, basketball is not considered an Asian sport here in America. You'd be playing on the road, specific gyms in the Ivy League, and they would yell racial slurs to them. It was shocking to me to see racial taunts in the Ivy League because you think that at that level, certainly in this supposed, you know, very academically progressively oriented group of schools full of Asian students on their campuses, that that would be something that was unthinkable, but it wasn't. And I just told them it's a sign of respect. Yeah, they're ignorant, but at the end of the day, they're trying to get in your head. You're thinking about what they're saying and not thinking about the game. I think we were just working out, and uh, kind of was like, you know, Jake, can I speak to you for a moment? He sat me down, like right outside the gym on the stairs, and he was like, I don't know if anybody's ever told you this, but I think you can be an NBA player. And he kind of looked at me like, you know, he just saw Santa Claus or something. You know, I was just like, you're crazy. You know, I was like, dude, you are crazy. My mom, you know, would be like, you can make it to the NBA. I'm like, all right. Um, OK, Mom. Is this possible? <laughs> I thought, oh, maybe he really, really, really have a chance. When the question was broached, is Jeremy Lin good enough to make the NBA, that's when I think a lot of the interest started surging. Can you tell me the history of this blanket? Yeah, this blanket is legendary. Yeah? It's all about Lion King. We have Nala right here, baby Simba, Timon and Pumbaa. This is one of my favorite blankets of all time. What about the Sesame Street blanket? No, my second favorite is the Garfield and then Sesame Street. Oh, man. All right, fans. Good evening, and welcome to the 2010 draft at Madison Square Garden in New York City. The first round, we weren't expecting really much anything. Tonight marks the realization of a dream for the best young players in the world. We were just all real nervous, <laughs> just because there are so many odds to overcome for him. With the first pick, the Washington Wizards select John Wall from the University of Kentucky. I was hopeful, but to be completely honest, I was like, let's just wait and see what happens. The things that I'm always interested in is race and, and the way discrimination you know, rears its ugly head. I was really interested in seeing if a team would take the plunge and take this Asian American player. You know, it's funny. Like, the, the team that I had the highest chance to get drafted by was the Knicks, because I crushed that workout. With the 39th pick in the 2010 NBA draft. I was like, if I don't get drafted here, I probably won't get drafted. The New York Knicks select. I'm thinking like, oh, if I get drafted, what's gonna happen? I'm just gonna run around, like hugging everyone. I'm gonna fly to New York tomorrow. Landry Fields from Stanford University. Ten minutes after the draft ended, Donnie Nelson, the general manager of the Dallas Mavericks, personally called Jeremy and asked him to play on his summer league team. I think everyone who goes undrafted you know, feels like they have to prove themselves because they do. And so, you know, this is a chance where you get to play against people who are drafted every single night and uh, you get to compete with them in practice. And this is the best opportunity to, you know, prove to all the other teams that you deserve to be drafted and you deserve to have that contract. Lynn, surprise attack. Oh, this is going to be interesting. Sanders there, Lynn protected at home. Wow, nice play. Oh. I hoped that Jeremy would make it because I had confidence in his ability, but I, I was skeptical in terms of him getting a real shot anywhere. And then I watched him play in the summer league against John Wall. I think we've got a prime time matchup. John Wall, the number one, one overall selection. Wall, creative on the reverse. How fast was that? I talked to him the day before he was gonna play against John Wall. And I told him, it's your one shot. There's no doubt that you can play against the guy. Lynn, Lynn getting up there. He's going to be an NBA crowd favorite. And got to work on the D. Lynn went right around him on his strong side. The fact that he could do that 
against the number one player in the NBA draft was, was tremendous. Assessing constructive criticism. No way. Man. If you explode on him, you'll have something. You're going to get your opportunity. Keep going as he splits, the spins, spin. and, and oh, oh, no, ref, don't you do that. They're on their feet. Oh, my man. God. Is this, is this about to be a melee in here? Oh, oh God. Man. Hold it back. Hold oh. it back. <laughs> oh, look at the crowd. It's going crazy. He's opened some eyes, and if, if Lynn doesn't stick with the math, there are teams out there that are looking at him saying, boy, he fit our system very nicely. And Whether he's in the league this year or not, he'll have some options. Uh, he will have some options. I'm just trying to play, and, and if someone's interested, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to talk about the opportunity. My son and he both were point guards, and they were on different AAU teams. And so I remember watching them play these AAU games in these local gyms, and I just happened to buy the team uh, at that time with my partners. And one of the first things I told our GM was, look, I know this kid. My son knows this kid. He's really talented. We ought to give him a shot. I think they thought we were a little crazy, but we did. And you know, when you're the owner, you get to do things like that. The Warriors' IQ and basketball IQ just went up a few points. They signed Harvard guard Jeremy Lin. I called Jeremy to tell him he didn't believe me. He was like, stop playing, man. Are you serious? I said, man, it's for real. Go down to the practice facility tomorrow and sign the contract. It's good. And he was like, Man, I'll call you back. <laughs> I was like, ah, you know, I picked my little brother up. I'm like, I'm signing with Golden State. I ran to the next room. <laughs> I picked my other brother up. I'm like, I'm signing with Golden State. I can't even really describe it because we, like, grew up, like, fantasizing about the NBA. And, like, the fact that we grew up rooting for the Warriors made it just even that much crazier. Lin has a chance to make history as the first Asian-American NBA player in the modern era. When he got picked up by Warrior, that moment, we think, this is what God wants him to do. My dream was to play in the NBA, and now I get to do it for the Warriors, the team that I grew up watching. It's more than a dream come true. It got pretty loud and people were standing up and clapping and I just remember looking around. Grew up a Warrior fan, signed by his hometown team. It's a great story. It really is. It was so emotional uh, for me to finally get there, for me to finally be there. And I couldn't even envision myself there even a year ago. When I saw him guarding Kobe, I was like, wow. We've been watching this guy ever since we were little. He's actually, he's, he's there. Missing, lead with the rebound. I love what Lynn did, didn't foul him. Ready to return for the Grizzlies. Williams, Lynn's got an open look and then threw it to Battier inexplicably. Welcome to the NBA. I hate when everyone's looking at me. I hate the spotlight. How am I going to be myself when every time I touch the ball, everyone expected me to do some crazy, miraculous play? People could see it on my face. Like, I was out there playing, but I wasn't playing my brand of basketball. I was scared, nervous, and just like a lot of questions and a lot of stress and a lot of uncertainty floating around. The ingredient that's missing is the fact there was a player named Monte Ellis and Steph Curry <laughs> ahead of him. <laughs> You know, coaches need to win at the NBA level, and so Keith Smart, who was our coach at the time, really didn't play him a lot, and this is how these things happen. At first, I was like, he knows I can play. He knows I can play. And then I wasn't playing at all, and then I was like reading all these articles, like, oh, he's just here to sell jerseys and increase revenue. And I was like, maybe that's all it is. Maybe that's all I'm good for, you know? I think we have to be honest with ourselves. There was definitely an, a marketing element to it. I mean, he's a hometown guy. The area has a significant Asian American population. And the way it played out, you know, people went bonkers for that. A lot of what America perceives as Asian is very foreign. 
Yao Ming was kind of a quintessential example of that, right? And he's like, he's from China, he's from the East, and he's coming to our shores. And whereas Jeremy is like homegrown, he's homegrown Asian American kid from the, from the suburbs. He grew up with hoop dreams just like the rest of us. Seeing a kid like Jeremy on the court in a warrior's uniform, you know, that, that's, a, that's a huge impact. You know, he was happy to be playing for his hometown team, but we weren't satisfied with just being in the NBA. That's why Jeremy Lin to go all the way to the rim and he has it taken away. The Warriors management sent Jeremy down to the D League, the NBA's version of a minor league farm system. He was faced with a harsh reality. The D League is one of the toughest things when it comes to a basketball career. The D League, you know, it's a showcase. People don't care how many wins you have. All they care about is your stats. It's all about you and you have teammates, but they're not really on your team. You know, they'll take your job if they can. You cut off and then you the point guard? Yeah. You pass it to me. Okay. And then just wait out there. What I told him when he went to the D-League was simple. Go kill it. Go and crush the D-League and let's get called up. Because it's a battle. You know, it's a battle. Right here. I was like, man, like if I play bad, this may be it. Jeremy Lin drives against Squeaky, tries to get to the rack, throws it away. I couldn't really sleep because I was so stressed. I called my brother, I was like, I'm tripping right now, like, I don't know what's going on. I think for him, it was just like the journey was kind of wearing on him. Because like at every step of the way, you have to like overcome all these odds and like, I think at a certain point it just, it felt insurmountable for him. So he was not in a good place. Lin needs to settle down. Yeah, he's running out of gas. Jeremy desperately wanted to prove that he belonged. But in his rookie year, he was sent to the D-League three times. I think getting sent back and forth and the constant yo-yo effect of being you know, taken up by the Warriors, sent back down, the cumulative effect of it uh, weighed heavily on him. You know, I've always had that desire, and I've always had that within me where I want to prove that I could play in the NBA. But, um, you know, I'm here right now for a reason, and, you know, God works in very different ways. Stay up! Stay up! Come here! You know, I thought with each game, his confidence grew, and you could see it almost with each possession up the floor. And after his 20-game stint, I think uh, he came out of that D-League experience really believing that he could have an impact in the NBA. It was tough because we knew he could play. It was just frustrating because so many people were so ready to just bury him and give up on him. Um, it's hard for me because I really love basketball. Like, I love my dream. My dream is playing the NBA. And I wanted it so bad that I couldn't imagine finally getting it and then losing it right away. Does anyone in here think LeBron is not as, is not as good as Kobe right now? I think LeBron is definitely not better, just bigger. Oh, man. Uh, it's kind of hard to say. You, you know better than us, so. No, I don't know. I just had close receipts. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you guys are in here. Good. On here, in here. Nice. Corvick in the left, left, or right, right. Corvick. Yeah, I like that. This is a good group right here. Hey, hey, don't move, don't move, don't move, don't move, don't move. Stay out there. All these Asian kids are like intimidated by me. I like talk to them, they're like, uh, I'm like, dude, I'm not like Frankenstein. If they're really tall, you're gonna get stuck and, and then you'll get called for a shot. Right here. Ricky has something to say. No problem. Thanks for coming. I remember in the D-League, um, I kept a little diary. Uh, I know that's a little girly to some of you guys, but I like to write down some of my thoughts every once in a while so I can look back and remember. And uh, I remember on December 29th, I wrote about how I actually wish I had never signed with the Warriors. I wish, you know, I, I wish I could quit basketball because um, I wasn't having fun. And what got me through those times, obviously I don't feel that way now, 
But what got me through that time was uh, the, the number one reason why all the leaders are here today. And that's because we want to let you guys know that God loves me um, and that he, he has a perfect plan for me. And that his plan will take me through a lot of ups and downs, but if I stay faithful to him, in the end, I know that he's going to work everything for my good. Now when I play basketball, I don't play for anybody else anymore. I only play for God. And that's the type of purpose that he gave me. And once he gave me that purpose, then that's when I had my peace. And once I got my peace, that's when I got my joy. Sometimes, a change of scenery can shift our perspective on life. My roots is important for me to know because it's who I am. It's a huge part of my identity. I understand where my parents came from, how they grew up, and the culture. Oh, oh, he dropped it. He dropped it. So that's why I come back every summer, just to get a good feel for that. I'm very proud to be you know who I am. Back on the farm. Uh, I'm back up a little bit now. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing where my dad grew up, so 40 years makes a huge difference, you know, just from him growing up here to how we grew up in the U.S. So it's definitely humble beginnings. Uh, <laughs> My grandparents are born and raised in China. My parents are born and raised in Taiwan. And I was born and raised in the US. And so there's a lot of history um, and a lot of culture behind who I am. Judge this dope contest, this is the finale, the championship game for the Nike Summer League, so we're about to get into it right now. They said I can speak Chinese. <laughs> Basketball culture here is crazy. The, the fans, they love basketball. There's people playing basketball all the time on all the courts. Uh, the level of competition is definitely growing. Got a chance to see some games. And so, you know, it's, it's definitely awesome coming back and seeing how much the sport has grown in the country. I just think coming here, I'm seeing a 
lot of really diligent and hard workers. I feel like everybody works very hard and they do everything they can to support themselves and their families. And for me, that way is basketball. And I think hard work is definitely ingrained in, in Taiwanese culture and Chinese culture. And so for me, that's something I try to pick up on and really embrace. Yo, man, we gotta go. Jeremy. At 12.01 Friday morning, the NBA locked out its players after failing to reach a new collective bargaining agreement. A lockout has a very large impact on a lot of people. The current offer that is on the table is not one that we can accept. It could be a couple weeks, could be a couple months. We're already hearing this is going to be a very long lockout. We're about to go into the nuclear winter of the NBA. The collective bargaining process has completely broken down. And we're all in this together. And if these players don't give them what they want, they're not going to play. I don't think it's resolved. I think it's bad advice. I actually secretly wanted the lockout to continue because it gave me extra time to get better. We are willing to continue discussions on a potential compromise. There are some owners who are willing to forego the season. We want to play basketball, that's what we do. And right now, we don't have an opportunity to go out and do what we do best. If we need to lose an entire season, we should go ahead and do it. I got all my sweaty t-shirts in here, man. That's disgusting. <laughs> and so I knew the longer the lockout went, the better player I would become. We're warming up. We're just, we're just warming up. Boom. That's it. That one was perfect. You feel good? Feel good. Yeah. As he gets better as a shooter, over time, it's going to be like money, money, money. He's only going to get better, and he's awfully good now. Don't you think? That's the other part, getting into this cranium to get him to believe, like I believe in him. Merry Christmas, basketball fans. The NBA is coming back. Fans are getting what they want. Owners and players reached a tentative agreement to end the 149-day lockout. Going into my second year, I'm not really, like, thinking about anything I'm afraid of you know I, I feel like through my first year at least in my own eyes like I proved to myself that I can play at this level and and I think mentally I'm at a much better place where I'm just going in and I'm just going to be myself and, and play my own game and from that standpoint I'm really not afraid of anything going into training camp I feel like I have nothing to lose. We didn't have a center that we felt good about, and we needed to create enough salary cap space to go make an offer. And in order to do so, we had to cut somebody. It was one of the hardest decisions that we could have had to make. They called me up midway through in the middle of a drill. They're like, hey, you got to go upstairs. I went in there, and the general manager and assistant general manager were like, we got to let you go. We're trying to get DeAndre Jordan. He had worked tremendously hard preseason. So I was like, man, this is a blow. I mean, this is, this is a kick in the stomach right here. They are like, oh, we wish you the best of luck. I was like, thanks. Within 48 hours, he was picked up by the Houston Rockets. Yeah, we were hoping no one else picked him up. Yeah, we were interested in him for quite a long time. Had been to his games at Harvard. At the time, we just added him and said, hey, let's bring him in and see what happens. I went to Houston. There were six point guards there. I couldn't even get reps in practice. I don't understand. I was backup point guard at Golden State, and now they're going to bring me here, and I'm sixth string. Spurs 
Biggs right in his face. When the Rockets picked him up, that was probably the bottom of the barrel for him. Sunday night, we were in fellowship, and um, I remember Jeremy said, hey, I, I got to go. I got to catch my flight to Houston. He was standing at the door, and he had tears in his eyes because um, the pressure was really getting to him. He just didn't know what his future was going to hold. And I remember he turned to me, and he says, I don't know if I can keep doing this. After only 12 days with the Rockets, he was cut again. It was Christmas Day. So, all right, obviously a lot has been happening in the last couple weeks. What's going through your mind and, and how are you feeling today? Christmas morning, I was waved, flew back home on uh, Christmas night. And within two weeks, I had been waved twice by two teams who said they still wanted me. 10 a.m., this morning, um, found out the Knicks had picked me up. And that's gonna be my first game with the Knicks. It's gonna be at Oracle Arena. You know, I'm literally going into this game tomorrow night. I have no idea who my teammates are. I've never played with them one time. I have no idea what plays we run. I don't know a single play. And, uh, you know, I haven't even talked to the coach yet. So, it's gonna be interesting. And I see Jeremy Lin coming in. They just signed him today. Went to uh, walk through a shoot around today. Nuno played with Golden State last year, sparingly, played in the D League. And it's a nice ovation. It's a great opportunity for me to be able to just play. And I think for me right now, the one thing I really care about is just an opportunity to play. I'm going to give my best effort. And uh, if, you know, if I go down, I'm going to make sure I go down doing it my way, um, which, is, which is God's way. And so it's the night before and you know I gotta get my bags ready and after the game tomorrow we head to LA, Sacramento, and then I'm off to New York for good. Five games go by and I'm not playing at all. But nothing was really making sense to me. If you bring me in and you don't let me play in practice, let alone the games, then why am I here? But I felt like, you know, I could help you, and I was watching us lose. The Knicks have lost four straight games. And the losing streak continues. Knicks have now lost six in a row. There's a chemistry problem there on the floor. They need a point guard to distribute the ball. Jeremy's original two-year contract was about to expire which meant that if the Knicks let him go, he'd be dropped with no pay, and this time, for good. During practice, Jeremy would stand right beside me on the side of a court and, uh, and not really get in even in practice. He was just there in case one of these guys got hurt. I pretty much saw the writing on the wall. I was like, I'm pretty much done. And like, I was resigned to the fact that I was gonna get let go. Standing on the side of the court, he comes up to him and he goes, uh, hey, coach, uh, I've got a question. I go, what is it, Jeremy? I'm taking a taxi anywhere, everywhere. Should I ship my car out here? And he was like, uh, you know, probably not. I was like, oh, hell, I'm going to get waved. <laughs> and so I went and talked to Glenn. I said, Glenn, what do you think? And he goes, well, we haven't really seen him. We don't know. And I said, you know what, let me try to see if we can get him in a couple games before Tuesday and just see what happens. They're like, look, you're going to play tonight. I want you to go out there. I don't want you to do too much. I was like, OK. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> Eight points for Barnett. Lynn coughs it up. Bradley to the rim. I didn't do too much. I pretty much did nothing. I played horrible. You know, I missed shots, I had turnovers, I had bad fouls. Lynn reached in. I thought, at most, I had one more chance the next game. I was like, okay, I just screwed the Boston game. I probably will get cut, but they may give me one more chance tomorrow. I think at the time, Jeremy was actually staying with his brother in New York. And he was talking to me on the plane. He's like, you know, my brother, he's got some people over. Um, so, you know, is it cool if I, if I crash at your place instead? 
you know, I was like, yeah, sure, man, come, you know. I was given forewarning, though, that my couch wasn't huge. It was actually a rental couch at the time. It might have been maybe six feet long. We get in at like two in the morning. I go over to Landry's place. He's like, this is my couch. And his couch is like this big. I'm like, dude, I have my head hanging off of one end and my legs hanging off the other. I'm like, oh my gosh, how am I gonna get a good night's rest? Like, I might play tomorrow. This might be my last chance. I remember thinking to myself, one, I hope he gets in because he really didn't do enough in the Boston game to warrant getting big minutes. And two, if he gets in, he's gotta play well or they're gonna release him after the game. It's funny, this season was the only season in the last like 11, 12 years since the last lockout where people have played back to back to back games. And New York only had one stretch of back to back to back games. And if we had more days to rest, I'm not sure if I would have been able to play in that game. I prayed that day, and my prayer is, God, if this is your will for him to play NBA, you need to show us. And there's Carl. Morrow packs it down. Williams sets himself, puts up the three, and knocks that one down. Yeah. The Knicks find themselves down by 10 already. Again, Mike, look who's coming in. Jeremy Lin, and you're a pretty big ovation. He didn't look tentative. He didn't look overly concerned. He looked like, dude, I'm about to go do it. If they cut me, they cut me. If I don't never play another NBA game, so be it. I'm going to play like Jeremy Lin can play. Jeremy Lin drives and finishes. Nice play from Lin. There's a strip of it. Lin throws it ahead to Tony Douglas. Up for the layup, backs it in. Here comes Shepard. To Lynn. Lynn flips it up and puts it in. Jeremy Lynn once again. He finished the half with like 10, 4, and 4. Like good numbers for a half. That was such such a higher high than like anything he's like done. So I was like ecstatic at that point. The second half, he just went, he just went nuts. Driving to the basket, does it again. And a chance for a three-point play as he got hit. Up by Petro, gets to the rim. And Special night become a garden favorite. Will it be remembered? He was stringing together like three crossover moves in a row, like things he's never done before. Splits the defense again, gets to the rim, pucks it in, and a foul! Wow! And the crowd on their feet fan honors to this man. But even it looks like his teammates don't believe what they're seeing. I was just so emotional. There's no way they can cut me now. I just had the game of my life. Again, the crossover. The basket puts it up. Puts it in. Jeremy Lin with 25. And this crowd is going crazy. Penetrating, manipulating, devastating the Knicks. He's the hero from Harvard as the Knicks get a much-needed victory on the game of his life. And he is sworn by his ecstatic teammates and a jubilant crowd here at Madison Square Garden. I'm just thankful to God for this opportunity to be able to come out here and play with this team and this organization. Man, I was taking a shower and I was like, I didn't even know, I was like, is this water like from the shower or am I actually crying like tears of joy? Oh, I was just like, so high on emotion, I was so happy. I was sitting in the shower, replaying all of the times in the D-League, all these flashbacks of these tough times I had to go through. And I remember I got out, I saw my family, and they were all smiling. I called my agent, and he was yelling at me on the phone, you know, like, I'm so proud of you. I knew you could do it. That was kind of like 
the much needed breakthrough that I was hoping for. Before Jeremy Lin's first big game against New Jersey, uh, he really wasn't in the Knicks' plans at that point, and I'm told they had begun to look seriously at replacements. Clyde, Saturday night, Madison Square Garden sounded as loud as we've heard it all season. He was magnificent. You just hope from a Knicks standpoint that he can run the offense as well as he ran it on Saturday. I just really wasn't nervous for my first start. And, you know, usually I would be, but I don't know why I just felt really comfortable. And it was just a supernatural piece. And it's one of those things that, you know, I can't really explain. For Jeremy's first NBA start, Amari Stoudemire was out for personal reasons, and Carmelo Anthony suffered an injury in the first half. Carmelo Anthony comes up hobbling. He's in a lot of discomfort. He can't move right now. The Knicks desperately needed a leader, and Jeremy would answer the call. Lynn gets around Jefferson, looking, and backs it in. He had a couple of those the other night. We were running pick and roll after pick and roll after pick and roll. Lynn's inside. I didn't know how he would follow up that New Jersey game because it was such a high. But he just kept making ridiculous layups. He was hitting jumpers. They didn't know my tendencies. They didn't know my weak spots, my strong spots, my sweet spots. They had never seen me play. I'm riding like friggin' secretary. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Lin with his second consecutive career. Now. He is the new starting point guard of the Knicks. There's so many little variables. With every step of the way being something I can't control, uh, you know, Houston waves me a day late. If they waved me a day earlier, I would have been past the waiver wire. Shumpert gets hurt that morning. The Knicks pick me up because they had worked me out the year before. You know, it happens to be D'Antoni who's coaching here, whose offense is tailor-made for me. And all of a sudden, things just go crazy. He's averaging 26 and a half points a game in the last two games. <laughs> I, don't, right? I don't think that's going to continue. Obviously, that's not going to continue. And then we hit the road and go to Washington. And it's like John Wall again, you know? Like, I played against John Wall in the summer league. And now it's like a rematch. Now I'm playing against him again. Ooh! Lynn on the drive, gets inside. Oh, He kind of dunked on my head. I was like, I'm gonna try to get him back. A couple possessions later, they messed up their coverage. I had a free lane and I just tried to take the rim down. When I saw that opening, I just tried to dunk it as hard as I could. I don't know, it's just, there's been so much pain and so, so many trying times and now they get to play. I'm just letting it all out, man. I'm just letting it all out on the floor. After the game, I just look back and I'm like, man, that was so fun. The great story that's brewing is Jeremy Lin. And this week, contracts are guaranteed for the rest of the year. He's been balling out saying, show that man his money. The things that's for real is what he, his vision, which won't change, his uh, speed, which won't change, his uh, knowledge of the game, which won't change. I just don't see it changing. You know, now, again, please don't quote me on that one. <laughs> now he's on the scouting yeah, report. He is now. Let's see if he's in the scouting report for the Lakers on oh, Friday yeah, night at the Garden. So, this is basically where I lived the last two weeks, and so it's the couch I slept on. Uh, my brother and sister-in-law uh, did a good job of hosting me. Had a lot of fun. And now their little kid might have to move out. <laughs> if I don't do laundry now, I won't do laundry when I'm married. Fact. You guys are brats. 
So we do other things. Like what? That's in your house. That's in your house. That's in your house. Like what? That's in your house. 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 That Yeah. Yesterday, the general manager was like, "Hey, Jeremy. By the way, uh, you're guaranteed now, so get off the couch." I was like, "This guy has a place to stay, but he doesn't want to stay there. He wants to crash in here. I don't want this to be on the news. <laughs> Jeremy is sitting on the couch of his brothers. Why? <laughs> It's crazy. It's just crazy to. I'm, t I'm telling you, social media, Twitter, Facebook, my phone. It's just." I don't know if it could get crazier than this. Like, I really don't. Jeremy Lin, are you following that story? I have no idea. I know who he is, but I don't really know what's going on too much with him. Are you surprised at the production that Lin's had over the past week? I don't even know what he's done. I, I, like, I, don't, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. I'm reading all these quotes that, about what he's saying. Kobe Bryant has no idea who Jeremy Lin is. I'm like, what? I'm like, why would you do that? I didn't say anything about you. I, I never talked bad about you. So when I heard that, I was like, here we go. Would you consider guarding him if, if he's having one of those games? Good. <laughs> 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 okay. There is a, a new man in town. May the best man live. Over under 23 points for Lynn tonight, Bomani. So against the Lakers with those trees they've got inside, it won't be so Lynn sane tonight. Kobe or Lynn? Who scores more tonight? I'm going with my guy Jeremy Lynn. <laughs> <by here>. Because <laughs> you might do all, that. All he does is Lynn, baby. <laughs> Jeremy Lynn in just one week has turned things around for his career and for the New York Knicks. I love it. It's awesome, man. This is like the greatest thing to happen to New York ever. It's one of those nights and it's one of those stories where it really is why we love sports. I didn't know how it was going to turn out, but I was like, I'm just going to be really, really aggressive. Everything was going well. Everything was going down. Win puts it up. Puts it in. I think the one thing where I kind of lost it a little bit, he'd come down, he kind of like stutter stepped and spun and finger rolled it. Then likes the open floor, spinning, puts it up and backs it in. Sensational play for Jeremy Lin. The guard erupted, and to do it on the national stage, anybody who saw that moment will never forget. Electrifying the garden again. He's got 18 points. Welcome to our studios for the Jeremy Lin Toyota <laughs> Halftime Show. <laughs> Jeremy Lin was superb, 7 of 12 from the field, 18 points, 5 assists. Kobe Bryant, the Lakers, struggling shooting the ball, but they're only down by 8. Bryant, a couple of fakes, going to put it up and uh, knocks it down. He... Struck by Lin, stolen by Lin. Left side, separate, left-handed Lin. Bryant spinning. Difficult shot <laughs> for some. Yeah. Kobe Bryant again. He is starting to get in one of those zones right now. Gasol is on Lynn. Puts up the two pointer. Puts it in. Jeremy Lynn with 31. And a rebound by Jeffries. favorite play of this whole year was when I hit that three in the corner just because that game had so much hype and that shot was kind of the dagger that put the game out of reach for them. Already cut twice this season sleeping on a teammate's couch because he had nowhere else to go and suddenly Jeremy Lin is the toast of Manhattan. This is it right here. This is my dream and uh, I'm just thankful to, to God man because This is this is my dream being lived out, and I'm so thankful for that. Jeremy Lin. 
38 points. It's the most by a Nick this season. Linsanity continues here at Madison Square Garden. It's indescribable, really. It's something I've never seen before. I didn't foresee this coming. You know, it's unbelievable. This is like how weird I am. I was like, I'm gonna go off this game, and at the end of the interview, they're gonna be like, oh, so do you think Kobe knows who you are now? Jeremy, you knew somebody was gonna ask you this, but uh, do you think Kobe knows who you are now? If they ask me that question, I'm gonna be like, who the hell is Kobe? That's what I was gonna say. And then I like thought about it and I was like, I prayed about it, I was like, you know, what would Jesus do? And I'm like, Jesus probably wouldn't say that. So I was like, I'm gonna change my answer. Uh, you, well, you guys had to ask Kobe. I don't know. Let's get to what matters in sports today. Jeremy Lin. Right now, the biggest star in New York is Jeremy Lin. I don't even think you have to be a sports fan to hear about this yeah. story. New York has a raging case of Lin sanity. That's what it is right now. It's just real mm. madness right now. All I do is Lin, Lin, Lin. What do you think? What do you think about all this? Um, it's crazy. This is crazy. One of the biggest headlines in sports right now is Lin Sanity. If you haven't caught it yet, you will. Lin Sanity takes New York by storm. He was a last-ditched effort for the Knicks. They sort of said, all right, who wants to play? And he raised his hand and, all right, get in there. I have never seen anything like this in all my years of covering sports. I've never seen somebody go from a no-name to an absolute phenomenon inside of two weeks. It's unbelievable. He's doing it with charisma, with style, with flair, and he's having fun. It's crazy. Yeah. Catching fire. The Linsanity. I think it'll probably be in the dictionary in the next version. Linsanity? I, I love it. I love Linsanity. I'm so happy for him. Jeremy Lin's 89 points, the most by any player in his first three pro starts since the ABA NBA merger. Outside to Lin. Crosses over Widnow and hits. Jeremy Lin up top to Fields. Lin a whirling dervish right to the rim, zigzagging to the cup. The Knicks have stolen one. It's their fifth straight win, their longest of the season. You have been surpassed as the most famous person who was a Harvard graduate. I knew about Jeremy before you did. Are you taking while. credit for Linsanity? It kind of feels I, like I, you are a little bit. I can't take credit for it, uh, but, uh, but I, I'm just saying I was there early. What you said is a great story. What's the greatest part of it for you? <laughs> that we've won five in a row. <laughs> That's for me. Uh, just everything. Just you know, here's just what's right with sports. He's an underdog that uh, came up. He does it right, the right way. Can he play in the NBA? Yeah, of course. He's got all the tools, and he's playing really well. You, that, that's not a fluke, how he's playing. They had this one dude courtside who was just yelling at me the whole game. He's like, you're a one-week wonder. You know, you're not going to win this game. You suck. We were playing bad. We were tired. And I was like, man, this is going to be a tough one to pull out. We were down five with a minute left. You know, got this huge steal. Layup, down three. They're coming down. We get a stop. The and one at Amir Johnson, who I believe had five blocks to that point, ties the game. Lynn takes the three, drives, goes in for the layup. It's good, and a foul! Lynn could tie it with a free throw. They come down, missed shot, and now we got the ball with, like, 20 seconds left. Lin to Shepard. Shepard pull up jump shot. Back to Wilco Chandler the rebound. And the Knicks will hold it for the final shot as the 24 second clock is shut off. Mike D'Antoni won't call timeout and let the Raptors set up their D. The crowd on its feet here at the Air Canada Center. Lin puts it up. Center. 10 seconds, everyone standing, 20,000 in Toronto. Get out of his way! Let him just take powder on himself. Three seconds, Lynn sizes him up, straight away, three, buries it! <laughs> Point five remaining. Lynn Sanity continues. I'm just glad it went like this so we can calm the Lynn Sanity down a little bit. <laughs> we couldn't get a stop. <laughs> That's all I dream about is hitting the game winner and then doing some cool little 
dorky pose and then walking off. You know, that's like all I did growing up. I always wanted to do that. I wanted to know what that felt like. He's got the game. He's got the attitude. He's got the swag. He, he's got all of that. Okay. Thank you for being, or do I do the first part? No, okay. Not. Hey, Jeremy. I mean, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> it's driving me out of my mind. <laughs> Just dial star star Nix on your iPhone or Android phone. Or go to NY Nix. Can't get it out of my head. Head. <laughs> that girl is poison. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> to all my friends in Indonesia, to all my fans in Singapore, to all my fans around the world, thank you for all your support. Open Gangnam Star. <laughs> Insanity is catching on even halfway around the world in Taiwan. Igniting a crowd in Taipei that went to a bar at 8 in the morning to watch him on TV. Gangnam Star. He's handled everything very well, as you said, unflappable. But if there is a chink in the armor, where can Lin improve his game? A chink in the armor. A chink in the armor. Nice build. He's got long arms. That's what you need as a point guard. And he's really, I mean. What about his eyes? <laughs> He's he's great, he has great court vision. Take away the Lin punch. Mm -hmm. This is what you end up with. Amazing. Now, that, is that even... Is that even legal? Jeremy Lin, yes. That's real. Jeremy Lin coming out of a fortune cookie. This whole thing is showing how unprepared we were to deal with this culture in this context. Lord Mayweather and Jeremy Lin. Sweet. All the hype is because he's Asian. Black players do what he does every night, don't get the same praise. First of all, what he said I think is racist. Not only can he compete and, and make it in, in the NBA, the guy's tearing it up and is breaking records, you knucklehead. Check it out. He does the math to win. <laughs> yeah. For many years, we've had many stereotypes about Asian Americans, and now they're all kind of coming out like there's no big deal. They are a big deal. And that'll do it. Street comes to an end in disappointing fashion, and the New Orleans Hornets and Jeremy Lin are the Knicks in their first loss of the Jeremy Lin era. Now it's easier for me, you know. Someone will say something racist, and I'll laugh, and I'll think it's funny. Everything I get now, like all the negative stuff, I'll just put it in one place and turn it into positive stuff, so that I could use it the right way. And when I play out of anger, I play horrible, and so um, I had to learn how to control my emotions and then just like let it go. Because当你在突然一下子成为一个明星的时候,肯定会有很多很多的事情发生,很多的人很多的人出现。所以在这个时候呢,我希望他更多的和家人待在一起,因为家人是对自己最大的,最无私最大的支持,就家人是会给你最
So did you know that new Knicks sensation Jeremy Lin has a brother who's a freshman point guard for Hamilton College? We did, though. Even we didn't know that today's Continental Home Finale would bring out the entire Lin clan, including the Linsational Jeremy himself. I did not know he was coming to my game. And I actually heard from a couple people on campus, like, hey, your brother's coming. <laughs> I was like, no, he's not. <laughs> I've never really had that before, have that kind of hype around one of my games. But I didn't see it as that big of a difference. It was just my family watching my game, so. I mean, he did come down before Linsanity happened. He had come down and watched my games before that, and no one really cared. For the last, like, two years, he was never enjoying himself out there. But in that New Jersey game, when things were rolling, for the first time, he was just like having fun, living his dream. I think that was like the best thing from Linsanity. The big question now is, can Linsanity continue? I don't know how long it's going to last, but right now, I don't care. Lin out of the corner for three. Go Anyone who said they saw this coming is lying. There's a lot more that he can do than anybody knew, and it comes down to confidence. Jeremy on the drive. For Jeremy Lin. He got the bang in the bucket. He's got that swag. He has that it right now. This transcends sports. It really does. He has shined and evolved into the best story in sports today. Pressure in the backboard. Oh, and the steal to the out there having fun and playing the game. I can have bad games and you know they may not like me or they may boo me. There's a lot more important things in life than just basketball because at the end of the day basketball is just a game. The show continues on Broadway. It's a story with many spokes an Ivy Leaguer, Asian American athlete, guy off the end of the bench speaks for everyone who didn't get their chance. It's only a couple of weeks, but in New York City, and on basketball's big stage, this guy has hit it out of the park. What happened to me, the story that happened to me, I mean, it wasn't like I, I knew I could just come off the bench and do that. I really didn't. Um, I thought I could play at this level, and I thought I could be a good player, but I didn't, I didn't feel like that would happen. And some of those experiences out there when I was on the court, I felt like I was being controlled by some something else. I felt like I was having an out-of-body experience. Some of the plays that I made, some of the, the wins that we had were just so out of this world that <laughs> I still have to pinch myself to really believe it. As Jeremy ends one chapter and begins another, the road ahead will continue to test his perseverance, but his faith will forever guide him. The thing I had to learn last year is a perfect plan doesn't mean that it ends up the way you want it to end up. In the past, if you asked me what a perfect plan, I'd be like, I get what I want, I get my dream, I play well. Now I have a different perspective on what a perfect plan is. You don't get better if, if you win all the time, you know? You get better when you lose, you improve when you lose, you look at yourself more when you lose. 
So if you learn a lot, or if I learn a lot, if I grow a lot, if I become a better person through tough times, that's part of his perfect plan. That's part of his perfect will. When I was going through all my insecurities and uncertainty and lack of confidence, I was losing focus on God. I was focusing on all these other things like my job and what other people thought of me and what the reporters were writing. You know, over time, I was able to check myself and kind of get my focus back. And I think God did something supernatural in me, something that I couldn't do on my own, something that I may never be able to recreate. So I think in that instance, you know, it's just learning to fight to constantly live and play for God. And when I do that, I'll be able to walk on water.